Amen. From ancient times, man has tried with the utmost of his energy and resources and time to try prolonging life. And there is a deep desire for the eternality of his existence. Man has always sought to live beyond himself when it comes to this facing of pain, facing of sickness, you know, ultimately the facing of death, we become very scared. And so there is that deep desire within us to preserve life. And man sought even to preserve, as it were, you know, the dead, the dead body. He knows that he is going to die and somehow he had that veiled knowledge that after death, you know, there is possibly a resurrection. And therefore, from ancient history, we would observe how the Egyptian pharaohs, the Chinese emperors, went through great lengths to build their tombs and to preserve their bodies in their afterlife. There seemed to be that veiled knowledge, we said, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead that causes men to go to such great extent to preserve the dead body. But we all know, uh, we said, alas, through the thousands of years of human history, death has been the greatest impasse for all mankind. It is that gate to the unknown that we all has, have no solution. Uh, even in the modern age of microbiology and nuclear physics, uh, man could not unravel the secret to eternal life. And man's quest for knowledge to understand his own makeup has been at best inadequate and deficient. He realizes that he has not arrived at a full understanding of his own existence and his future beyond the grave. And that's why we said so many people are so confused. What is the reason? For all this confusion, well, it's because they have not known right, the truth concerning who they really are. And so Solomon, in writing this book of Ecclesiastes, seek to give enlightenment to his readers, a perspective concerning truly what life is for mankind. And he began his um, presentation of how he wants to bring that message to us by showing us the delusion of life, which he called life under the sun or life under heaven, which he would use the word vanity to describe, right? And we know that word vanity simply means a bubble, empty, a meaningless life. And so he lamented from the beginning to the end. He says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And this was how he began that message. And this is how he is going to introduce his final message. And he has just painted for us that process of aging, right? last week we, we, we saw how uh, man sees the reality of the end of life. And um, he becomes weaker as the body naturally breaks down with age and time. And he goes to his long home, 
there seemed to be no escape. And he is saying to us that this world's ambitions, this world's desires, this world's pursuit, if you bring it to a conclusion, gives no real satisfaction to the soul. For when we breathe the last breath, that's where we leave behind the fruit of all our labour. We cannot bring with us. So he's teaching us the concept that anything that is of real value must be eternal. What is of value must be able to last. And so between the temporal things and the things that can last for eternity, he wants us to make an evaluation. Right? What are those things that make for eternity in life? He tells us, do them. It will be profitable for you. But what are those that you, know, you find will cost you to be rudely interrupted and disappointed? Then he tells us that you pursue it with a degree of understanding right, to its temporal, temporal uh, advantage. Okay? So he's telling us that men seem to be left without choice. There is lack of a better option when death strikes. And, you know, to receive a news that life is going to end in six months, in one year, can be very shocking a news. Right? Whether it's for the person, whether it's for the family, it's tough because we don't know what is beyond that unknown, you see, that impasse. And we fear that separation, right? that separation to our, what Solomon calls our long home. And therefore, he asks that while we are alive, whilst we have strength in us to evaluate life. And that is why he says, you know, between the wise and the foolish, all die. Is there any difference? Between the rich and the poor, between the man and the beast, all must die. And if we speak about this temporal life, you'll find that everything is the same at the end. And that's why he calls it vain. He calls it empty. Why strive so hard if you're going to be disappointed at the end? So he's asking us, before you channel your energy into those activities, consider first its value. He is very clearly, we said, discouraged. If he pursues to the end the logic of life under the sun. And that was what we did. Right? We have spent 24, 23, 24 messages from Ecclesiastes chapter 1 to Ecclesiastes chapter 6, the end of chapter 6, to follow Solomon through this pursuit of life under the sun. And he showed us how futile it is. Without God in the equation of life, life is that meaningless. And he showed to us right, the kind of pleasure that one can expect to um, enjoy, how fleeting they are. And you wake up at the end with a hangover. Right? And uh, the hangover uh, oftentimes uh, hit us harder you know, than during the time of the enjoyment. And so you ask, we ask ourselves, is it worth it? Is it worth it pursuing 
this life under the sun. And so he tells us that it's not worth it. And he tells us that rather than experience it, learn from the experience and flee from it. And so the Lord wants us to think, right? why do we want to consume, go after the garbage of this world? You know it's garbage, and yet, you know, we want to go after it. Why is it that we, you know, love uh, looking for uh, treasures, uh, build our life upon treasures? Right? That's, that's pursuit in the life, in this world, in its final analysis. Right? Why do you want to go to the garbage bin to look for treasure? Right? If, we, if we haven't been awakened, then we would do that. But like Moses, right, we were studying his life, how he was awakened to see all that is glittering is not gold. Right? He saw right, all the pomp, all the rigors, all the prestige, all the privilege, all the wealth of Egypt was not real in the final analysis. And he saw it. And he decided to wise up. And so it behooves us also, while we are living our life, to also wise up. Um, and that's why he spent the next half of the book, from chapter 7 onwards, all the way to the end of chapter 12, right, which we have spent 17 messages, whereby he, told, he tells us very profitably, step by step, how we can live this life profitably. Right? So you remember, we, we, he began with the house of learning, or the house of mourning. Right? We spent two messages speaking about that. Right? He tells us that you should go there because that's where you see the end of life. And then you work backwards right, to where you are now. And you, know, you seek to live your life in the light of where you will be later on. And he tells us various aspects of how we can live this life well how we can live this life wisely, how we can live this life of faith. And we spoke about the investment of a life. We spoke about how we need to wise up, how we can live well, how to handle the enigmas and the hardships of life, how to understand authority in life, how to understand men, to understand the benefits of heavenly wisdom. So we went through uh, in no uh, in great greater detail uh, concerning what kind of life would be profitable for the people of God and a careful study will lead us to acquire heavenly wisdom to live this earthly life Profitably, and he 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 wants us all right, to be rich toward God, and not rich toward the world. If you are rich toward the world, you'll be disappointed. But if you are rich toward God, then you know you would not be disappointed. But you know that there is a reward awaiting for you at the end of life, and therefore. He sought to help us to think right, in this last section of our text from verse 9 to verse 14. A truthful revelation. Right? So he's saying to us uh, from verse 9, uh, he says, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many 
Proverbs. So what did he do? Well, he took time to put together the wisdom that he has collected from the meditation, from the Word of God. So he collected a set of Proverbs and how he classified them. And he, after putting together a good storehouse of godly material, he also systematically shares them. He not only taught them, but he shared with them in such a way that they would be able to absorb, in such a way that they would be able to understand, in such a way that it would help them to gain insight to life and be able to make wise decisions how they are to live life. And so, verse 10 says, The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that was... That which was written was upright, even words of truth. And so you recall how he was so careful to choose the right words in order to provide the maximum impact when he tells us, when he speaks about life, right? we are willing to listen because he speaks in a very succinct, clear, thoroughly thought through manner. He says, to everything, there's a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which was plant. You remember? He speaks of life and he was able to articulate it in such a real manner so true that he helps us to see life for what it is okay. and he helped us to nail down these important truths and he helps us to master them as students of the truth. And he warns us, he tells us that there are many opinions in this world. If you go around asking 10 different persons, you will get 10 different answers. Everyone would give their own speculation. Everyone would give their own conjectures. Everyone would think you know, with, the, with a very fertile mind. And that is how man came up with the idea that he came from apes. Indeed, a very fertile mind. But we all know we don't come from apes. We are created by God. So if you leave man to his imagination, when his imagination run wild, He's going to be way off target. And that is why Solomon is taking that process to painstakingly bring us back to God, bring us back to the truth. Right, so he says, My son, be warned. There is no end of opinions ready to be expressed. Studying them can go on forever and become very exhausting. Now, if you want to hear the opinions of men, right, you'll find that you get very exhausted because they will tell you all sorts of things. Then after you take your time to think and ponder over what they said, then you said, Ayah, this one holds no water. This one is no good. This one is crooked. Remember when we begin, uh, when we were studying, uh, we begin the book, we, we, we spoke of these things. He tells us about wisdom, right? how the wisdom of this world is crooked. It cannot be straightened. No matter how you try to fit it, you know, you can't fit 
circle into a square or a square into a circle. And so he tells us that he has gone through a painstaking process to choose the right words, to frame the right heavenly thoughts that God had revealed to him to deal in it, to tell us about life. So he tells us what is not, and then he tells us what it is. Okay? And this writer, Charles Swindle, he puts it very well. He says that Solomon is portrayed as a photographer. And the word photographer means written with light. Right? Written with light. That's the meaning of the word photograph. Right? And we think of Solomon as a cameraman. Right? So he goes about taking snapshots. Right? He got a camera hung around his neck. And everywhere he goes, he sees life and he would take a snapshot. And there he sees another aspect of life and takes another snapshot. And he would take many, many different snapshots, many different aspects of life. He clicks here and he clicks there. And, you know, in every imaginable place, he makes that click. And he tells us that there is death, that ugly, colourless, reality. And then he continued to make his click, right? Swindle says, more shots of cynicism, doubt, despair, gloom, depression. And he tells us, how is it that this world is so colourless? He sees this world under the sun as stuck black and white. You know, nowadays we take full colour photos. Right? Um, gone are the days where you would take black and white photos. Uh, recently, you know, uh, we were in our family, we were embarking on taking black and white photo right, for a family project. And so, we look for a film in order to go to a shop you know, find a shop that still possess black and white photographs right? and take a photo. And then we would compare and you would see how those photographs, black, that is black and white. Right? Wow, you see no, you know, the life that is in it is so faint right? compared with a photo with its full color. And so Solomon is telling us uh, he's taking snapshots of life and he's putting together uh, this picture, this panorama of life in order that we may be able to see well uh, what life is. Okay. And you know, this writer, again, I, I find him very interesting. Right? He illustrated in, in a very uh, a good way. He says, Solomon is basically writing a sermon for us. And he begins this, you know, like someone taking a round trip in an airplane. Uh, you take a round trip in an airplane, uh, you go to the runway, right, and you would, you know, ski off the runway and you fly to your destination. Right? When you are taking off, you could feel the, 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 the excitement. Right? It's exhilarating, so exhilarating taking off. And then when you are back on the runway again, you know, so relief to be home. Right? You have gone for a distance. Right? You don't know what to expect, but you are back home again. And then you have the trip that is behind you. So the same runway begins and the same runway ends the journey. So Solomon is, in a way, trying to wrap up his message, right? He begins 
by telling us about life. And then he tells us what we ought to do concerning life. Then he brings us back again to the reality of life, telling us life to the very end. That was what we saw last week. And then he brings us now to a stuck reality. Verse 14 and verse 13. A judgment to come. That's our two thoughts. Uh, this truthful revelation and a solemn duty. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So Solomon tells us that there is an eternal consequence to man's actions today. He has built up his case and now he seeks a decision from his reader to take heed of his warning. You know, and we spend 40 weeks. 40 weeks is not short, right? But 40 weeks, when it is well learned, the lesson of life right, can bring us a long way through life. So here, he's bringing us that conclusion. Okay, he says, Moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment. He's telling us now that at the end of life, there is a time of reckoning. And he says that our actions has certain consequences. And he's asking that we consider, right, consider what we are doing. Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. A wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Now, what I'm doing here is to take out uh, in all throughout that, the book the words related to God's judgment, uh, which he mentioned. Right? So he's bringing to us this picture uh, that life lived it's not without its consequences. Okay. And whatever we do, uh, there is an impact at the end, in the sense that you know, God will be the one, there will be a God, right, the God of heaven and earth, who would be bringing to pass to make a judgment of life. And so, it is like what we said earlier, uh, taking snapshots of life, right? but this time it's your life. You know? Not just snapshots, but a video of your entire life. What you did throughout your life. And then whatever you have done in your life, right? whatever that is recorded, it cannot be erased, and whatever that is recorded, uh, you'll be evaluated based on what you have done. Okay? And so he's saying to us, let us wise up. Right? Let us be ready right, to face our Creator. Let us be always living right, to, with the end in view. Okay? Let us live with the end in view. So, he says, because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore, the misery of man is great upon him. If he chooses to do what he wants, ah, that's where, you know, at the end of life, he would say, I, I don't know what struck me. Why life has become so miserable? Right? And we ended in uh, Ecclesiastes 11.9. You remember, he says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thy heart, in the sight of thy eyes. But know thou that all these things God will bring thee into judgment. So he's saying that, you know, not all things you need to try. I have lived that life, and I'm saying to you, all right, that there are some things you try to your hurt. Right? So, he's telling us, giving to us, perhaps no clearer picture of hell judgment 
that there is a judgment to come. And I can think right, of no better uh, passage than what Jesus gave in the story of the rich man and the beggar Lazarus. Right? The story Jesus gave, how that rich man fed sumptuously, dressed so well, uh, eat so well. And then there was another man called Lazarus. He was a certain beggar. Right? The rich man was not named. But Lazarus was named. Right? When, when you see that a name is given uh, in the Bible, you know, God is giving an emphasis. You know, this, this person uh, has there's some significance to that life, you see. That he's, he's, he's uh, 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 named, all right? And desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And he says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sore. So he lived a really, what we said, pathetic life. Right? And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Who is Abraham? Well, Abraham is the father of the Hebrews. So this man, Lazarus, right, was a Jew. Right? Abraham was the father. And, you know, that he's going to return to heaven. Right? Where the father, Abraham, right? we, we, we know how he lived his life looking for that city in heaven. So this man, Lazarus, he had one good thing in his life. That is, he knew the God of heaven. And because he knew the God of heaven when he died, he was carried to heaven. But this rich man, for all, the rich, all his riches, when he died, he found himself in the fires of hell, so terrible. Right. He says, I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus' evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And between all this, between us and you, there is a great gulfed fixed, so that they which would pass from tents to you cannot, neither they can they pass to us. That means what he's saying here is that between heaven and hell, right, there is a separation. Okay? A person who goes to hell right, cannot jumps, jump to heaven and you know, a person that ends up in heaven, right, likewise, right, is safe from the torments of hell. And death brings that separation. Okay? And he's telling us this picture of reality, of judgment. Okay? And, uh, and the contrast there is given uh, that uh, Lazarus was comforted, right? but thou art tormented. And he said, would you... Give me some water to cool my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. He couldn't get out. And the least he could do was to ask that someone would go and tell his brethren, his family, don't come to this place. This is a place of torment. You wouldn't like it here. And what, did, what was said to him? He says that your own brethren have Moses and the prophets. They have the scriptures. They know what they ought to do. But if they choose not to, then, well, the judgment will come. And he tells him that even 
if someone would come from the dead to tell them, they would reject it. Right? <laughs> Did not Jesus rise from the dead? Did he not preach about the resurrection? Did he not raise that same or the man with the same name, Lazarus? Right? Died after four days. Jesus asked him to rise from the dead and he, he was resurrected from the dead. So Jesus was explaining to them right, there is eternal life, there is resurrection life with God through Christ. And that's the way to God. If you would take hold of it, this is goodness for you, for eternity. And so he tells us, do not end up there. Uh, this place of hell is a place of unquenchable fire. It's a place of memory and remorse, of thirst, of pain, of misery, of frustration, of anger, of separation of undiluted divine wrath of Satan and his host. So scary, isn't it? And then he tells us there is a place of praise, of singing, of worship. There is a place where there is no more tears, no more sorrows, no more pain, no more crying. And Solomon tells us, to see the conclusion of the whole matter. He says, fear God and keep His commandments. What do you mean by fearing God? Well, to fear God is to depart from evil. To fear God is to repent of our sins and to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour because God has made His Son Right, to be the mediator between God and men. Roman, uh, John 3, 13 to 21 says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he, Jesus Christ, that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So the Apostle Paul says to the children of God, saying to you who have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So, we can choose. Right? We can choose to, to live our life, well, to do good in our lifetime. And the psalmist wrote in Psalm 41, verses 1 to 3, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. And Jesus said 
in the day when we shall be rewarded for all the good we do in this life. Jesus says, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done unto one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. May God bless His people to live profitably for Him. This concludes our study of the book of Ecclesiastes. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank Thee for Thy word. Thank Thee for Thy mercy in granting to us understanding out of the truth that is revealed through Solomon's pen in his old age for our learning that we may flee youthful lust and Lord to remember our Creator in the days of our youth. O oh God, I pray that whatever time that we have on this earth, we do not know whether it's 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, 15 years. Lord, only Thou knowest. But when, while we have life, while we have life, whilst we have life, may Thou be gracious to help us to live this life profitably with eternity in view for eternity's reward and be to escape eternity's judgment. O oh Lord, be very merciful to thy people. Help us to cling on to Jesus Christ and to enjoy his unsearchable riches as we abide in him and receive life from him. This I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.